During imprisonment sometime around A.D. 62 or 63, the Apostle Paul finds himself writing to a church that means a lot to him. This is somewhat of a thank you note uh, for helping him not only uh, financially but prayerfully supporting uh, the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. At this particular time, we find him in Roman imprisonment, and he's writing to this church that he loves so much. Now, he does give some direction, and he does give some instructions for the church and for daily living, uh, but it also serves as that thank you note uh, to those who have supported him. And we get into chapter 2 in the section of Scripture that talks about Christ's exaltation. He became obedient, and God exalted him. And Paul is using that train of thought through the Holy Spirit's guidance to explain to the church that we are supposed to have that type of mindset within us. We are to be that type of humble, that type of uh, person, that type of conduct, that type of walk. And so we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to stand to honor and to reverence the reading of God's holy and inspired Word. Philippians chapter 2, look in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Our Father, we're standing now to reverence and respect your word, which we understand only you have the words of life. I pray that today they'll be proclaimed in truth and in Holy Spirit power from on high. And I pray that today people will respond because they've heard your voice, not some man's opinion. But that, Father, again, you by your Holy Spirit would draw. And, and, I, and I pray that today lives would be changed and that people would be saved and Christians would be strengthened and challenged. And that, Father, you would add to your kingdom and add to your church and add to your mission here, Father. I also pray for those who are watching on the web now, Father, I just pray that you'll speak to their hearts as well. And, oh God, that we would hear from you today and apply it to these lives that we may serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a partially true, uh, good bit of truth, to something that the outside world says about churches quite often here, uh, especially as of late, that there is not a lot of real in the church anymore. And this cuts against our grain in terms of, well, how dare you say what's real and what's not. But I believe that God could use this for us in a such a way that it would be a gut check to us to say, okay, so what is real? What is real? What am I doing that is real? What is the church doing that is real? We would believe, uh, and I hope that you would understand, we build foundationally upon the fact that there is a real God who sent his real son to, into this world to save real sinners. We build upon that. And that the Bible is the real inspired word of God. It's the truth. It's what we go off of. It's the plumb line, if you will. Sadly enough, sometimes the way that we live and the words that we say give an impression other than what we strive to be or want to be or claim to be. And this happens to all of us and it is a very, um, very intense examination that must take place in order for us to get ourselves in uh, God's will and to get into the real place that he wants us to be. But this causes a level of uncomfortableness, so many of us avoid it like the plague. And I shared with you uh, last week a couple of uh, false advertisements uh, that churches uh, typically put out there. I want to share a couple of more of those with you just to give you kind of the idea of what, uh, what we're talking about. Um, you hear churches say that th at this church we proclaim that Jesus is Lord. But then they come back and follow it up. But why, do, why can't they stop collecting money and taking money for missions and stuff like that? Don't get me wrong, I don't mind giving a dollar or two here and there, but do they really have to have money? 
Let me, explain, let me explain something to you. Either Jesus is Lord of your life or he's not. That includes your checkbook. That includes your time. That includes your participation in church. That includes who you are when nobody else is looking. Churches sometimes say we love to fellowship. But then you hear responses like, does anyone realize that church is only supposed to meet on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock? Isn't there so much more to church life than Sunday morning at 11 o'clock? If you do it right, it will be. Churches will say we're concerned and we want to reach our community. But then you hear things like, I wish they would shut down things like the food bank or the ministry to children and teenagers. Don't they know that that costs a lot of extra? Sometimes we say and do one thing and we believe something else and our actions show something completely different. And I do not want to lead this church in a direction to where the message is muddy. But I believe that our clarity should begin to define us in that they know who we are. And most importantly, that they know who Jesus is. That'll make all the difference. So I'd first like to talk to you about having a real obedience Look in your text in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Now, this word obeyed here is a kind of a neat word. It's two words in, in the Greek language put together. Um, hupo and uh, okuo. This is where we would get the English word acoustics from uh, when you're talking about hearing things. And the word obey there is that complex word that is putting under and to, uh, to hear together and it means obedience it means that someone puts themselves in a spot under uh, someone that that they can hear that they can put themselves under some someone that they can hear it's those two words coming together to give you the idea of obedience i'm going to explain something to you that is going to be extremely hard especially in our day and time we are so immersed in freedom and liberty and thank God for the freedom and liberty that we're given first in Christ and second in this United States of America. However, sometimes we can get the wrong idea that since I'm free, I'm my own man, I'm my own woman. Understand this, you are not your own, you have been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God in your bodies. If you are saved, if you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you ask him to deliver you, you became a bond servant to him. And so I don't like that. I don't, I don't want a master. I don't want somebody lording over me. Then you don't understand salvation too well. You're just after fire insurance. The truth of it is we submit ourselves under certain things in order to hear so that we can obey, so that we can carry it out. You are submitting, whether you realize this or not, you are submitting yourself under the preaching of the word here so that you can grow and you can apply it, correct? This church will stand and will honor and will continue to focus our worship times around the instruction of God's word because that's the only way that lives are going to be changed. The preaching of the word has to be critical. It has to be crucial. It has to be center. How can they hear unless there's a preacher? How beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things. Speaking of the gospel message. So let me ask you this. Have you submitted yourselves under so that you could obey? You know, so I listen to preaching. Um, I, I don't know if, if you know this or not, but uh, I believe that I'm supposed to grow as a pastor as, as well. So I listen to preaching uh, every week, you know, and of course... Uh, always studying and trying to grow and, and read and learn. You know, sometimes I don't want to sit under preaching. Some of y'all don't want to today, do you? Sometimes I don't want to hear what's about to come out because I know I hadn't been doing so well in that area. It's uncomfortable. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to do this movement of God thing correct, you submit yourselves under in hearing the word of God and you place your life under that 
you'd understand that throughout God's Word, the idea and concept of submission has been so misunderstood. I'll give for you an example. When we talk about having God as our master, the Scripture tells us that He is the only uh, true and high potentate. He's the only high one. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and that we talk about submitting to Him. Well, some of us are a little bit okay with that. But then you get to Scriptures that are a little bit more thorny or, or, or that bother us a little bit more. And rather than study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, we just say, well, I'm going to shy away from that part of the Bible. I'm going to take that part of it out because I don't want to hear that. The Bible says, do you know this, that wives are to submit themselves to their husbands? Nobody's preaching that in pulpits anymore, are they? Y'all are saying, boy, he's getting brave up there. Well, and again, I don't have time to get into it right now, but let me explain something to you. Guys, don't poke your chest out because you're supposed to submit to God. And if you're not doing that right, you can't expect your wife to submit. And by the way, that word submit doesn't mean exactly what you may take it to think. Better do a little bit of study in there to find out what it really means. We also are told that we're submit to one another. You're to submit to one another. Honoring the other person is more important than you. That cuts against the grain. Jesus not only taught this, but he modeled it by picking up the towel. He said, the one that is going to be greatest amongst you will be the servant to all. We submit. So I would ask you this. If you have that big of a hiccup with the concept of submission, how in the world can you stand up during an invitation and sing, I surrender all? That is sending a mixed signal. It's not real. There's a real obedience that takes place, whether anyone's looking or not. Now, Jesus, again, modeled this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, earlier in uh, the, the same text that we're reading. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the point of death, even the death on the cross. Christ humbled himself under the Father's will, and it cost him his life. But Jesus willingly did so, knowing what it was going to be. But he did so to honor his father. Parents, I want to ask you this. How, can you, how, how, how in the world can you expect for your children to honor you? Uh, the first commandment with promise. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth. How can you expect that to happen when you don't honor, honor your own heavenly father? in your home and this is no excuse for someone to dishonor their parents but I'm going to say this to you parents you got to understand that you're going to give an account for what you live in your home as well as in the church in the workplace on the road wherever you are let me really get you ruffled up people that hold positions in the church you need to understand it's very clear that teachers are going to be judged more harshly it is a great reward and it is a great honor to be able to serve God. But you need to understand that there is a great cost that's involved with it. That's because people are going to be watching you. And you say, I'm not around anybody. Nobody knows my secret things. God knows because God sees all. And be careful because your sins will always find you out. Think about Luke chapter 2, the Lord Jesus uh, was young, one of the only accounts that we have in his youth. They got to looking for him, uh, Mary and Joseph. You remember his response, how is it that you sought me, wish you not that I must be about my father's business? That word wis there means don't you know, but it also means can't you see? Don't you know I must be about my father's business? Can't you see? I've got to be about my father's business. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, Jesus was praying in the garden. You remember this, O oh my father. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Never, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Do you think Jesus really wanted to go to the cross? Now you would say that his desire to go to the cross overwhelmed 
his desire to run from the cross. And I would agree with that. But understand, Jesus knew what it was going to be. And sometimes in our life, we get placed in these positions where we know what we're going to walk into. And sometimes we run. Or sometimes we know what we're getting ourselves into and we face it anyway and ask for God's strength and His grace to get us through that particular thing. But don't miss the importance of having a real obedience that whatever God is going to bring you to, He's going to bring you through. That God will not allow you to suffer above or be tempted above that which you are able. But with that, we'll give a, a way of escape. That you're not tempted above that which you're able. And you hold on to scriptures. As the Apostle Paul said, For I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Or you hold on to the story of Joseph when you get into uh, Genesis chapter 50 toward the end of it. And I believe it's over there around verse 20. Uh, what you had intended for evil, God intended for the good. And you get into Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that God works all things together for the good to the good of them who love him, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And you begin to understand that that trial, that mountain, that obstacle, that sickness, that issue, that person, whatever it may be, may be there just for this moment, but that will come to pass. And you understand that I'm going to make it through this because God doesn't neglect his own people. And you begin to realize that it is about the obedience to it. God's the one that's going to handle the rest of it. So God, help me to be obedient in the midst of this trial, this storm, whatever it is. God, help me to be obedient and you'll ride it out. You'll ride it out. I'm in the process, I'm, I believe in memorizing scripture. And I'm in the process of trying to memorize one. And I'm scared I'm about to butcher it. But it's in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24, and it says, And it shall come to pass that before uh, they call, I will answer. And before they, uh, they ask, I will hear. Listen, God knows what you need before you ever open your mouth. So you've got to rest comfortably in the fact that he's got this. And you've got to focus on the obedience. And he will give you what you need to be obedient, by the way. He will not allow thy foot to slip. He will not, the psalmist also used, he will not allow you to be caught in the snare. Talking about laying a trap for a bird. That's what the imagery is there. That God will not allow that to happen to you. But it's when we take ourselves out from that, those two words, those Greek words put together, meaning under and to hear, combine them together, which gives us the idea of obedience. It's when we take ourselves out from that boundary of being under and to hear that we get caught in the foul or snare. Do you understand that? When we take ourselves out from that covering that God gives. That's where the disobedience is going to lead to the destruction. I want to talk to you about one other thing before we draw this to a close. There is such a thing as a real obedience. And there's a, 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 such a thing that we're going to talk on next week, if the Lord gives, in talking about reactionary obedience. We're going to touch on it a little bit today, and we're going to go into more depth on working out your own salvation with fear and trembling we're going to define that and break that down if the lord so wills next week the text says in verse 12 wherefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed not in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling again we're going to define that for you better next week but there's the call to work if you're going to obey God, you're going to have to understand this. It's going to be in motion. 
If you're going to obey God, it will come with action. There is the aspect that you use your mouth to love and to obey God and others, to serve others, to serve God. But there's also the aspect of putting your hand to the plow and moving. Galatians 6.10 says it like this, As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. And I love this one just because I love the imagery, but in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Sadly enough, there's some of you that wouldn't shine if you put brand new LED bulbs in you. If you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to say you love Jesus, you're going to have to understand he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he even boiled it down really, really simple for you. Love God, love people. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. On those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love God and love people. In bringing this to a close, in James chapter 1, this is a verse that brings great conviction to my heart. And I hope it does to, to the church as a whole. I've used it several times here in sermons to, uh, to explain the necess uh, necessary stand for action. But in James 1.22 it says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I was listening to some quotes this week. I like quotes. And um, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I guess it was a God thing. But um, this week I got into uh, Teddy Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's quotes. If any of you have ever heard of any of his quotes, uh, he made some really famous ones that, uh, that are still used today. People may not know where they came from, but they're really, really cool quotes. And... Uh, this particular one really spoke to my heart. He said that knowing what's right doesn't mean much unless you do what's right. Knowing what's right doesn't mean much unless you do what's right. And I said, oh Lord God, help us. Help us. I'm convicted that if there is a need for obedience to God, that the church should be modeling that for the world to see. And it's not going to start just by a church coming together at Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock and saying we're obedient. It's going to be the day-to-day -day life. It's going to be that this is the culmination of that, the celebration of it. How can we believe that we're going to affect the world around us when our message is not clear? And it's going to begin with a real obedience. You have to build on being obedient unto God. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I'm going to ask our praise team and uh, musicians to come on forward. And I'm going to ask for some prayer warriors to come down. We're going to have a time where... We give you the chance to make a public decision. This is what it's for. If you've never accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, if you've never surrendered to Him, if you've never asked Him to be your Lord and Savior, today needs to be the day that you do that. Please do not leave here unless you've accepted that free gift of salvation that the Lord Jesus extends to you. Also, if you're not a uh, if you don't have a church family, a church home, or maybe you believe that God's leading you to join up here and you'd love to be a part of this church, understand this. We're going to keep the main thing the main thing. We're going to build off of Jesus Christ. We're going to stay in the Word, and we're going to stay on mission. But we'd love you to be a part of this church family. We'd love to have you. And also, maybe you stand in need of some prayer. We'll have people that can pray with you. Life happens. And the church is supposed to be there to encourage and inspire others through.
let us stand in the gap and pray with you and pray for you. And if God so calls you also to sign up for a time where you'll stand with us and pray for the nation during this time of invitation, we'd love to ask you to come up in a symbolic covenant act that you're going to take some time and that you're going to fill one of these spots and stand up in prayer and intercede on behalf of this nation. We'd love for you to sign up and be a part of that. As God so calls, I'm just going to ask you if you would to come. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word and what it means. And we thank you that you alone have those words that can change lives. And I pray for those who are sitting here today that know that a decision needs to be made. I pray that you'll give them the strength and the courage to step out. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that in all things you would receive the glory. And we pray it now in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Our hymn of, of invitation.